in the last Ask Pastor John podcast episode, episode 216, you focused on the doctrinal and emotional abuses in the charismatic movement, um, but you said there's other abuses to address. What are some other abuses that caused you concern, Pastor John? What I said um, was, lest we be harder on charismatics than on non-charismatics, we must keep in mind that all the abuses I'm mentioning, these have their counterparts, their mirror image in the non-charismatic churches as well. So in the previous podcast, we focused on doctrinal abuses and emotional abuses. And I would say that non-charismatics taken as a whole, all the Christians who don't practice the gifts, are far more guilty of these than charismatics. Think of all the doctrinal errors in the history of the church. Those weren't charismatics, by and large. Think of all the dying mainline churches today with all their moral and doctrinal aberrations. These aren't charismatics. And and think of the emotional deadness in thousands of non-charismatic evangelical and mainline churches. Those are those are deadly emotional abuses. And we just need to remember that if we target the, the charismatic church because of uh, things that are happening there, doctrinally and emotionally, let's remember the, the mirror image which are equally deadly are happening among non-charismatic churches as well. So here, let me mention two more abuses. There was doctrinal, then there was uh, emotional, now I'd add discernment abuses or lack of discernment abuses. And by this I mean doctrinally sound people who are not denying any fundamental doctrine and who are not loose cannons emotionally. They're just undiscerning and make mistakes that bring reproach on the spiritual gifts. And and this I, I have in mind First uh, Thessalonians five: Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Now, why would Paul say don't despise? That's very strong language. And I think it's because um, some of those folks were claiming to speak for God, and it resulted in foolishness. They they weren't speaking for God. And it, it resulted in an emotional pushback in the church. They said, we don't, want to, we don't want that. And Paul was trying to rescue prophecy from broad brush, sweeping it away entirely by saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Discern what is, what is good here and discern what is bad here. Don't throw it all away. Make distinctions in the various claims to, to hold it fast. So let me give a couple of illustrations from my life, or maybe just one. I have been prophesied over numerous times. And the two of them were just wacko. I mean, it, it was so hard in those days to try to take this seriously. I really resonated with the folks who were starting to despise prophecies. A lawyer one time prophesied over me when my wife was pregnant, said, your, your fourth child is going to be a girl and your wife is going to die in childbirth. And, and that lawyer, with tears, told me that... Uh, She was sorry she had to tell me that. So I went home, and I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, I'm trying to um, do what you said here in 1 Thessalonians. And frankly, I despise what that woman just said. Um, It proved out that my fourth child was a son, and I knew as soon as he came out that that prophecy was not true. And so I stopped having any misgiving about my wife's life. She's still with me now 30 years later. So that's the sort of thing that makes you despise prophecy. And then I was at a, another meeting where a, a well-known prophet, if I said the name, lots of people would know who it was. He prophesied over me. And I could tell as he was talking, he's just trying to fit in with the trajectory of my life and say some nice things about me. And what he said simply didn't come true that year. He said it's going to come true by the end of the year. It didn't. So I know the uh, lack of discernment that people can have, even when they're solid doctrinal people. So that's the, that's a third one, uh, a discernment issues that make us want to despise the gift of prophecy. And here's the last one I would call financial abuses. So doctrinal, emotional, uh, discernment issues, and now financial abuses. Um, People who treat their giftedness, whether in teaching or healing or prophecy or evangelism, 
as a warrant to make their ministry a means of getting rich. Um, And of course, you can hear even in that list of gifts I gave, evangelism and teaching, that I'm not thinking merely about charismatics here. Uh, we te- we tend to think of charismatics when we think of people abusing finances in this way. Well, <laughs> all you have to do is listen to the Twitter sphere to know that's not the the case. There are just as many non charismatic leaders who are using their uh, status as an uh, an effective. A spiritual leader to make a lot of money and accumulate a lot of money and look like they have a lot of money. And I want to say that there are a lot of simple, honest, humble, charismatic pastors living in mo- on modest salaries who are less guilty than many non-charismatics when it comes to financial abuses. And of course, there are plenty of non-charismatic pastors using their status to get rich and have lavish lifestyles. Now, here's the key text. First Timothy Six, And as it comes to the end of verse 5, it talks about false teachers who imagine, this is the end of verse 5, who imagine that godliness is a means of gain. So it's possible to have a teaching gift or a healing gift, some kind of remarkable gift that is so popular you make millions of dollars and then you start feeling entitled to it all lavish clothes lavish cars lavish houses lavish jets and hotel accommodations turning godliness into a means of gain and justifying it by the fact that you are so gifted and so many people are benefiting from what you say to whom charismatic or non-charismatic paul would say in verse 9 of first corinthians 6 Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So wanting that better car, wanting those fancier clothes, wanting that bigger house, wanting that longer vacation, wanting that that top floor hotel room that has the pool in it as well as the bathtub, wanting that stuff will kill you, Paul said. So my alternative is to preach Christian hedonism that says pursue contentment in God, not in things. Or let's let Paul say it. as Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. So one summary word to end. Charismatic doctrinal abuses, emotional abuses, discernment abuses, financial abuses, all have their mirror image in non-charismatic churches. We all stand under the word of God and we all need repentance. Mm, yes, so true. Thank you, Pastor John. And thank you for listening to this podcast. Email your questions to us at askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. You can visit us online at desiringgod.org to find thousands of books, articles, sermons, and other resources from John Piper, all free of charge. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening.